Good morning and welcome everyone for the Andre Scientific work, uh, Computing Workshop. Um, I am Tanya Pushpadas from the University of Bergen and Andres. I'm the course coordinator here. Together with me, your instructor, Ule. He will introduce uh, himself uh, before the start of his lessons. Uh, before that, I would like to give you some practical information as well as a general overview of uh, Andres. Um, Andres stands for Norwegian Research Infrastructure Services. We are uh, coll a collaboration of four universities, University of Bergen, Oslo, NTNU, and Trimso, and together with a public company called Sigma2. We collaboratively operate our national in e infrastructures and uh, be part of NRIS. We are uh, giving training to researchers and our users um, on different topics, specifically on high performance computing and for uh, programming language like Fortran and best practices courses uh, for high performance computing. So this is part of our scientific work, uh, computing workshop. This is uh, first uh, of its kind, and I would say it is a pilot one, and we are uh, planning to run a similar kind of workshop uh, in the upcoming semester and years. So as you have seen, uh, read uh, by my, in my emails. This is a two day, half day workshop. Each day we will um, we, we will teach you two different topics. Today it is about NetCDF, uh, file, working with NetCDF data format, uh, specifically in modern Fortran. So yeah, and uh, the we use the collaborative document. Uh, you got the link via email to ask uh, questions and we will um, type the answers there if there is something missing we will type it later also uh, and we will publish the q and a later um, and similarly we are uh, recording this event and we are publishing it later uh, after an editing so please feel free to switch off your cameras if you don't want to be visible uh, however uh, we will be editing so that uh, no, no participants are visible in the recording uh, when we publish it. So the, as I mentioned, the collaborative document that Ule is sharing now contains general information and link to the uh, train uh, and risk documentation and work paper, workshop page. And you can follow, uh, uh, maybe Ule, a little bit top. You can follow Andres uh, Sigma to newsletter, or you can follow uh, subscribe to HPC News UIB channel uh, to get notified with the upcoming um, work, uh, training related um, news. So yeah, uh, other important thing is we follow uh, Carpentry's code of conduct. That means being friendly and use respectful la uh, language. So that is applicable to both to you and us as the organizers and the instructor. So please, uh, please don't use any um, sensitive information in the collaborative document since it is pub uh, public. Uh, you can ask questions uh, uh, here. And the lesson materials, the slides and the uh, demo course are linked on this collaborative document, you can see that. Uh, the demo course are there in three places in Google Drive, GitLab, and also on Saga under the project, training project NN9 and 70K. That path is here, but uh, it is, it can, uh, the demo code are on Saga. You can, uh, the people who have access to training project only can access to this project uh, folder. So if you don't have access to this specific project, please download the code from Google, either from Google Drive or GitLab. And slides are available on Google Drive. And before we start, and uh, before I give Ule this uh, da Zoom dais, uh, we would like to ask you some icebreaker questions. There are three icebreaker questions. Please go ahead and fill in your answer. And below that, you can ask your questions. Um, and thank you for your time and interest in our courses. And I hope 
uh, you will have a great experience and feel free to use the collaborative document as much as you want. We will really would like to have a good interaction on the collaborative document. And uh, before much delay, I would first I would like to thank Ule to uh, give this pilot lesson of scientific workshop, uh, computing workshop. And I hope we can do it, uh, do it in the coming semester as well, Ule. And please uh, give an introduction to yourself and uh, go ahead with the lesson. We are looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I have a background in chemistry. So I'm neither a mathematician or IT by training. I have a fair background of IT from university and of course, uh, so close to a lifelong experience with, with computations and computation in, in, and so on. But that's mostly related to scientific computation and, and so on. So I am um, looking at the, the languages that you are stating below. Um, uh, I've always assumed that C is some kind of basic knowledge, but uh, over the years I learned that fewer and fewer people are, are fluent in C. But as a lot of the libraries are um, are written in C, uh, a rudimentary knowledge of C is always beneficial. And since Fortran is calling C, um, they are different traits of the two languages, then I will touch upon on, upon, on C I, so that you will see that there are distinct differences, but they both languages are very old. Um, they have been operating together for many, many years and calling each other, mostly calling C routines from Fortran from Fort because C is a, a language used for writing operating system and, and system tasks and so on. And, and functions and everything like MPI is written in C and, and NetCDF is written in C, HDF5 is written in C and et cetera, et cetera. And I see people are running Ju uh, Julia and Python and so on and, and R. Those are the up and coming or mature languages. Julia is more up and coming. <clears throat> the MIT people claim that it, first of all, is a substitute for MATLAB because MATLAB is so expensive. And other people are claiming that Julia will take over from Fortran. And Julia has a lot of interesting things. I mean, they use the full character set. So you can have, there is a symbol, <laughs> symbol for um, for the square root, the, the fourth root, the fourth square root. And <laughs> we just discovered that it's possible to use emojis. So the um, true emoji should be something smiling or something wild smile to so Julia is very, very modern. Fortran is more old fashioned text based and you have to type a lot of text. So it's very verbose. And yeah, and this is concentrating on, on, on doing it in, in modern Fortran. And the whole thing is an introduction to, to NetCDF. So yeah, which like there are a huge amount of programs to visualize. So I think the most an icebreaker question, what you do for, for visualizing. I'm not going to touch upon the visualization part here because this is a whole other whole other story. Um we go straight to the to the introduction. Come on. This is an introduction from a Fortran perspective, as I said. Um, it's here, it says self-describing. So it's possible to write a program that actually can print out what's hidden, what kind of structures in there. So um, if you do the NC dump to dump out all the data, you'll actually get most of the data and how it's self-described. And another more, actually much more important thing that the um, machine independent data, different computers used to store numbers differently. So before the IEEE 754 came along, 
there were many, many different forms for integers, for floats, for or real numbers. So it was very, very hard to take a binary file from, from let's say, a, a VAX 780 system, copying over to a, a deck station uh, that or or that was running a um, that was running a, a MIPS processor. It wouldn't read the binary files, so it was cumbersome. Now it's a bit better. First of all, they are most 8086 uh, x86 um, chips in in there, so they shared the the binary format anyway. But IEEE 754 set it straight that this is the format for for numbers on computer. That makes things a bit easier. But still today, if you get across a, a NetCDF written with Cray and uses Cray format for float numbers or the integer numbers, it could be easily read into today's computer. So NetCDF is is actually independent of, of the format of the numbers. So that's a very, very good thing. Um, it also create access and sharing of array oriented scientific data. So it's so-called structured data. Structured data could be in databases, which is the most common use of structured data, but this is also a way of storing data in a structured format. And then some disclaimer when it was it was developed and so on, but it, it's still developed today and it is very much in use, especially for the natural sciences, especially for, for geosciences. And there's a link there that you can read about the fact sheets on that CDF. Um, for the natural sciences, we are, well, I'm not a, a geoscience, but I had the, the doctorate in, in, in atmospheric chemistry, so I, I know a fair bit of this. Who are most interested in fields like this? A, let's say a global field that are uniform or not, well, not uniform, but they are like a field across the globe. They are a smooth field that can be described with, with, with the lines here connecting fields of the of same size of same numbers but actually it, it's a gradient field around the globe and that's what we actually would like to work on but since the computer is not too happy with this is hard to describe such fields using field equations for computation we normally go like this with grids you have one uh, grid in x and y direction or or latitude and longitude directions and height, the z direction for heights. So you have layers upon layers and, and grid cell and grid cells. So each of these grid cells has a number in three dimensions, x, y, and z. And this is how we operate. And then we plot the fields and, and smooth out. But we do computation on grids, hence grid points. So what's going on inside the net CDF. As I said, it's written in C. And then use data types originating from C. Check out the IEEE 754 if you're interested in more of this. The standard C data types apply <clears throat> character for an octet or a byte short is normally a, a two byte integer, 16-bit integer. An int is normally a four-byte integer, 32-bit. Float is a 32-bit float, and double is a 64-bit. In, in Fortran, the numbers are, are strictly more typed, <coughs> but you, you will find them, you will find them in Fortran too, uh, under different names. Um, C data structures are row major, while Fortran is column major, which has implications when you program. And you all know that the, the first index in Fortran is, is the fastest moving. So you should have your innermost loop should be on, on the first index. Um, they are all, all the NetCDF routines are functions. So, in Fortran, the return value need to be assigned 
you can't just call the function that will give an error. So you need to assign in some way. So you can do as I have three ways of doing it here. I can say status equals NF. NF is the prefix for the NetCDF Fortran functions. The NF90 and the open function, there should go something in there for it as an argument, but I just omitted that one for the example. That's one way of doing it. You can check the status if you like. You can just assume it's okay, or whatever. Next one is to put the output of the function, the outcome of the function into a into a, an if test to check whether or not the, the return value is equal to no error. If if it's not, then you call exit. Two is normally user user error, so I put in a two here. Exit will just terminate the program. Or you can make a call subroutine. So you say call check and then the, the F90 and the, the netcdf function as an argument to the to the check function. A different way of doing it, so there is more than one way to skin a cat. What you prefer is your choice. All of these are okay. They have different they you the first one re requires you to write something if you want to check the status. The last one will pre print out error messages and so on, even a text that get from from a list of of, of, of error codes. So I'll use mo use mostly the first one, but I've also have in the included in the example the other one. So you will see examples also from that. Uh, NetCDF, that it's uh, use a data model. It's a complicated diagram, but if you look on the on the left side, you see there are six original type. You can have derived types in in a later version. So characters, eight bits. Byte is also eight bits. So the they distinguish character and byte. That uh, a character is unsigned. A byte has a sign, so byte can be plus or minus is a number. And then short, int, float, and double. But character and byte are, are generally the same thing. I mean, they are eight bits. So this is C sign syntax, and it's signed. A character isn't really signed, but byte is. So they are all signed. And this is, it's different from Fortran because C also support unsigned. And but Fortran doesn't support sign, uh, unsigned numbers; they are all signed. Fortran is is designed for scientific work, and most scientific values can be both positive and negative. So, as I said, Fortran doesn't support uh, unsigned integers, and you also have types calling the Fortran like integer sixty four which is all called long int in the C, but C the, the standard doesn't really enforce that a, int, that a long is 64 bit. So the best option as always is to make, is to have full control over the data types and use the data types describing the length of it. And of course the string data type is just a number of characters and then Either the length is given or it's terminated by a zero as in C. So you see the, the one in red are called unsigned and so on, and that not supported in Fortran, but in 64 is. We have some examples about the, the, the long int and so on, or in 64, I should say. So going through um some more boring stuff. I mean, there is a slight bit of, of, of theory you have to to remember. It's self-describing. The NetCDF file contains about the information about the data it contains. So if you use the NC dump, you will dump out both the informations of the data and, and the data itself. It's portable. NetCDF can be read or, or written by different computers and there 
native format will be will be stored in such a way that it's possible to read them on other computers. It's scalable. Small subset of large data set in various formats can be accessed through interface. So even from remote servers, I never tried that one. But it, it can it can do big files and small files, etc. It can act even do parallel I/O, which I'm not going to touch upon, but it's possible. But la large data set need to be you need to make to to be careful with with the large data set because if you screw up, they can be very hard to read. Well, it takes a long time to read. So if you have very big data set, you need to actually read the manual about performance. For small data set, it doesn't really matter. But for big data set, it could take hours to read. So you need to apply a few tricks. They are, you can append data to a data structure without copying data set or redefining structure. You can share, I mean, one writer and multiple readers can simultaneously access the same file. So you open the file for read. Um, Many users can read the same file at the same time. Yeah, access to earlier forms will be supported in current. That's a, a forward looking. So when the next geophysical year, that it was a geophysical year a few years back, and it's generally 50 years between them. So the next geophysical year, the data you collected and stored on as net CDF should predicting the future is hard, should be readable in the next geophysical year. Um, yeah, I said should, I mean, who knows what happened in, in, in about 50 years from now, less, slightly less than 50 years from now. We can pray. There are, they are, uh, NetCDF used binary files to store the data. They are NC for the classical format. They are .nc4 for the version four of it. And they have classified the function into classes of function. Like there are some functions for, for this dealing with the files, some dealing with the variables, some dealing with the data sets, et cetera, et cetera. We'll, we'll come more about this later. But there are file functions that include create, open, close, and sync. These are the most common. And that's a class of, of file functions. The other one also have some, some prefixing to, to see what kind of class they, they contain. But the file functions are what you normally will start with to create a file or open a file. Then there are the data set. They normally could start with a D. Uh, create a data set give it a name and whether to overwrite it or not. I mean, you can open the file in in, in um, overwrite mode or you can just append to it or you can start not overwriting, overwrite. So it's, it's a read-only file. Open for access, give data set name, read and write. Put it into define mode to add additions, data set variables an attribute. Take out of define mode, checking consistency and additions, and the close writing to disk if required. So this is the uh, the workflow of, of of the of creating the file uh, and and an etcdf file and 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 closing it. There are also possible to inquire about number of dimensions, number of variables, number of global attributes. ID of the unlimited dimension, if any, and so on. Unlimited dimension is typically for time series when you can append append today's data to an already existing file and append tomorrow's data tomorrow. And that can grow indefinitely without any limit. But it has implications, the unlimited dimension, but we don't deal with this here, but, but for, for performance wise. The dimensions, Dimensions are defined when created. It has a name and a length, and they are referred internally as some, an integer called dimension ID. So 
you don't really have to remember any numbers. You just declare an integer for dimension ID, dim ID or something. And that will keep the dimension ID for the rest of, of, of the duration of the program. So you get the dimension ID when you declare the file. So you create a dimension, give it a name and a length. You can get a dimension ID from its name. You can get the dimension name and length from its ID, and you can rename the dimension. Dimension is a the name is as an actual string of number, a string of characters or numbers that you can give it just a name as any other any other string. So dimensions. Dimension is a number of variables given by the defined statement. So if we only work on a single variable, it's one dimension. So it's nothing to do with the with the, the rank like a matrix as a rank two. This is, we open the file, we define the file. We call it just the, the dimension, we call, it, we call it A. We put, um, we put it, um, no, we, we use the NC double. Again, look here, the C syntax. The syntax double means a 64-bit floating point number. There is, uh, you have to be knowledge about, have knowledge about the C way of doing that. Uh, you have to remember that an, a double means a uh, real 64. Then we have dimension ID and the variable ID. So let's say we try to do lat and long and level as I show you the globe with the, with the grid. We have latitude and longitude and height, which is the level, and times, which in four dimensions. So we define the name of the of the latitude of the longitude, the dimension, and we get the the or the, the the length of of the dimension, which is the n n l v l s, and we get the dim id back. Same go for the latitude, the number of latitude points, and the and then the, the, an integer return of the lat dim ID. We get um, the longitude name. No, sorry, the first one was that was uh, my mistake. I mean, I'm screwing it up. Uh, it's the level level name. Uh, then there are a certain number of, of levels and the height. So, and then the longitude. Number of longitude points and dim ID. And we have a record name and we declare that one as an unlimited. And that's the time dimension, which is unlimited. And we call it the um, record dim ID, the ID, the variable ID is, is there is returned with the, into the, the record dimension ID. But the, you, you have to use the, the unlimited, which means that this has no no set length. It's it's dimension, it's unlimited in dimension. And the record is used for, for the time, the time stamp or, or the record in time. So we have examples, so you don't really have to remember all of this by now, but it does showing you some examples how things are working. Then there is a, a variable for a NetCDF dataset. It's defined when the dataset is created. A NetCDF variable has a name, type, and a shape. A variable may also have values. NetCDF variable is referred to a small integer called variable ID. And the workflow is to create a variable, give its name, data tape, and shape. Shape is, is the actual rank here. So in, for an array, it's one dimensional. In a uh, matrix, it's two dimensional, et cetera. It can have in many dimensions. So you get the variable ID from its name, get the variable name and data type and attributes from its ID. And you put the data into variable and given variable indices and value. Put today this 
this is your data that you have stored somewhere in your computer. You put those into the variable and give it names and, and, and um, indices and etc. So put an array of values into variable, use given the variable ID, length and the block of values. So you get data values from a variable and put them into the IDs with, with the indices you need. So you get an array of values, core app, and edge length, and you can rename the variable. So variables can be multidimensional. Uh, below is, uh, is uh, a variable with a rank four. We um, declare a, a real number, 32-bit. We um, use the keyword dimension. And you see there are four indices here. It's called by column. Since we don't know the size, we just um, use a column to ind indicate that there will be a dimension there. And there are comma to separate them. So there are four dimensions. So we have a, a variable of rank four. It's uh, also called allocatable. So the, the size is unknown uh, at declare time. We don't know how, how big that one going to be. And we call it pressure out, which is the pressure field. Then we can take that variable to write it out on the file. We use the, the, the file ID, the NC ID. We use the pressure variable, variable ID, and we write out the, the field we just described uh, in, in the cold pressure out. So that's no filled with data and we write that out. And I, the green thing is what you will get if you inquire what's in there, like the NC dump to give you that there are 18 levels, 73 latitude levels, 144 longitude levels, and that the time is unlimited. So the variable that I allocated it's it's uh, is indexed with the um, with the time level latitude and longitude. We have several examples of this, but this is the, the one of the more uh, advanced examples. Then there are attributes that we can put attribute like text and so on. We can properties as units, like temperature has a unit, special values, maximum and minimum values, scaling factors and offsets. So we can create an attribute given its variable ID, name, data type, length and value. We can get the attributes from its variable ID. We can get attribute values from its variable ID. In principle, you can get most of all, all you actually need to know, we can copy attributes. We can do a lot of things. We can rename and we can delete. So attributes are, are quite interesting because that's you can put a lot of metadata to your data. So if you have a long text that you actually need to describe, describe your data set, you can put that into the attributes and the program that opened the file will be able to read that attribute and present your data when the next geophysical years are, are there and they can see, they can read what you thought about the data when you recorded it. So this is a typical thing that you can do for a very small data set. This is using the NC dump on a 1D.NC. You see it has dimension is 10. So N equals 10, there are 10 numbers. They are of type double, so they are 64-bit floating point numbers, and it's called A, and the N is is used to is the the name of the of the dimension variable, and it prints out the the content of, of the of the vector A, ten number. So NC dump is a nice program to to show what's going on. 
we'll also go through that in the exercises, but this is an overview of theory. If we do a bit more complicated example, like the, the uh, four dimensional mentioned before about um, some geophysical data, you see there are 18 levels of height of the atmosphere, 73 numbers of latitude and 144 numbers for longitude and time is unlimited. So you can append as much as you like. Variables are in 32 bit, their float, longitude, etc. And you see the attribute is units, degrees north. The other one is longitude, degrees east. Pressure is in hectopascals, units. And the flow temperature is in Celsius degrees. So you could use Kelvin or Celsius. I mean, Celsius is more more common, but more Kelvin is more scientific. So this is the Fortran code to actually define the one-dimensional net CDF file. We have an example, so I mentioned it several times. You use the create and create the file. And clover means that it's not allowed to, to write over. So you get the, you will get an error if you try to, to, to write. Uh, no, this is, you, if it's no clover, you will get an error, but this one is clover. That means you can overwrite it. So I assume if it's not already existing, it will be it created. If it's all, if it's already existing, it will be overwritten. We declare the dimension ID. You see the the data file is called NCID. And the next one, well, we defined, we use NCID. There's nothing stopping us from opening multiple files. They will all have their their ID, but we need to have a different name for the NCID that may either NCID2 or whatever, or an array of them. So you can open many data, but you need to to uh, specify it as the first argument in, when you do dimension. So we, here we have only one, so it's making it very simple. We declare it as, we call it the, the dimension called n, and we use the, an n, which it probably put to 10 somewhere else, and the dimension id. The dimension id will be returned to us and we don't really know, need to care what that number is. It is a number and we just use it as such. Next one, declare the variable, it's called A. It's of double precision. It's using the dim ID as the line before and the variable ID will be returned to us. Then we put in an N to the define. That's something that we have to to do to declare that we now stop defining. Then we put the data in the variable A out on the file and we close the file. And you see that um, they all need some assignment on the status. If you omit the status and uh, equal sign, you will get an error message. So the C functions always return something and since if Fortran sees such a function, it assumes that you will need the output of the function and for enforces you to to deal with it. And status equals is one one way of doing it. So that brings us over. That's enough theory for today. It will bring us over to some examples. But before doing that, I thought I should I should go through some some notes, even more theory, some notes about the data types. And this is a file containing in the material. So yeah, Ole, can you make it a little bit bigger? I can. Yeah, thank you. It is it is there in the GitLab repository as a last on the Google Drive. Right. Now it should be readable. Yeah, 
So I am using the, the ISO 4000 environment, which is um, a module that contains a lot of information about sizes and such. Some keywords become available like in 32, which are variable containing the number to inform the compiler to select the size. It's a 32 bit. There are people who use kind equals a number. That's actually very, very wrong and can be prone to errors. So you never know what the compilers actually use that. So many compilers use four for four byte, but not always. And some compiler use, let's say, kind equals six for the short for a 16-bit integer and so on. So using as a, a fixed number in your Fortran code for the kind is actually very bad. So please do use things like int 32 or int 64 or int 8, int 16 or 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 yield or whatever. So that couldn't can actually not be stressed enough. It can make hard errors to spot them in you they they are, look strange if you if you if you screw up here. So please do use um, constant given to you from the compilers itself. And since netcdf is written in C, and it uses older syntax in C, like int and long and float and double. So that's what the knowledge of C you actually need to know, unfortunately. But this is the way of life. They are portable, so yeah, might not 64 bit hence the X own data types, which is important. So you may need to make sure that you use the, the netcdf data type. Um, the like uh, uh, in 64 here is a 64 bit and might differ from the native long because there are different types of computers who define C long in different ways. It could be four byte, eight byte, or whatever. So be careful. I mean, if you run on very, very small computers, like you do, a, you let's say you put up an Arduino for for, for collecting temperatures or, or anything or, or, or whatever, and you assume that uh, long is 64 bits, it's not. Write a little C program uh, and uh, take a, a size of the variable. You will have a interesting results. So these are the the data types that are that are um, supported in NetCDF. And uh, maybe more important is that Fortran does not support unsigned numbers. So U byte, U short, U int, and U int sixty four cannot be used. And um, creating and opening a netcdf file. You have no clubber means that you want to clubber overwrite, access existing, share. So it can be written by one and read by multiple. I have never really tried what happened if you are updating and reading at the same time. But you have, it's possible to have range conditions here so that you have to take care of. You have offset for may putting in a 65 bit format. You have to read the manual to to actually get more information, not cover this in depth. You can have an HCDF uh, or a HDF5 compatible file, and they are fairly compatible. So you can write, you can read and write that uh, HDF file from the NetCDF and slight and somewhere vice versa if you if you want to do it. So NetCDF four and and uh, HDF five are more or less identical. They claim they are identical. I haven't seen any times when they are not. But you can read the manual and documentation. So these are just some more examples. We can just skip those and we can go over to examples. And Again, bigger, uh, bigger fonts. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. 
up moving things a bit around. But it's also a very nice time to take some answer uh, some questions if if there are some questions yeah. not many but uh, just want to emphasize that it would be nice to have more questions yeah there are actually two formats they are the classic formats and the netcdf4 netcdf4 are more or less identical to hdf5 so Maybe if you if you start right making uh, creating files today use that CDF four, so it it's easier on everybody. But there are actually two formats. Well, uh, classic one they could be classic can also be in sixty four bit. So most things are in sixty four bit these days, but uh, not everything. But the easiest thing for if you are creating files is to create them in, in NetCDF four. But I've done the, both of it in, in the in the examples. Yeah, so when did you plan the break, Stania? Yeah, I was planning at ten o'clock. Or do you yeah. want to have the break now and come back and do the exercise? I'm not sure what the, that was a lot of theory. Okay, if, then if, let us give the break now and come back yeah. and uh, do the exercise. I think it would nice to have the break now because that was 45 minutes of a hard theory and a boring theory. But it, 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 yeah, I want to convey some kind of theory because there is nice to have some insights behind the scenes. So yeah, take the break yeah. now until 10 or something. Yeah, break until 10. And I just want to mention in this, I put some blog posts today that you were mentioning uh, just about the questions. Uh, if you go a little bit above. Uh, uh, just after the lesson material and icebreaker. Where is this uh, blog post about Julia replacing Fortran? <laughs> Ah, okay. There. Yeah, so I'm putting information <laughs> there. Uh, you could find it later as well. All right, but uh, if you go down, we will have break until 10. And let's uh, have some coffee or stretch out like some um, and come back at 10 and do some exercise. Yeah, I think yeah. now we can about to break and, and the blog post link available. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, welcome uh, back. Uh, before that, stop. I just want to mention that I have added some more information on this collaborative document, like the NetCDF programming API, as well as uh, maybe after the icebreaker. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. the softwares, a list of softwares for manipulating or displaying NetCDF data that is provided from UCAR, that's uh, uh, Unidata. They have a lot of links for different APIs and softwares. So if you want to look in, look at do it be, later. Uh, that would be be a theme for for another workshop to, yeah. to display yes. and so on. Yeah. Yeah. But well, that's more your call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> anyway, anyway, yeah. Well, we continue with with the with the boring coding, but well, boring. Yeah. Example. Can you Very can you make it a bit bigger? Thank you. Even bigger than. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. Have it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Quite big. Right. Yeah, I can make this. I can do a little thing here. I can put the Emacs window there, and I can put the terminal here, so we can easily get them. I um, got into the first example directory. I assume that you download them. Um, the files and the examples and so on. On on top there are some. Um, so the, I don't think you have all the all these files with with the tilde at the end or so on or or. Um, yeah, or this one. So. 
There are a few things if you are on Saga or any of the other national system, there are a couple of things you need to to set up. If you are not on one of these, you are a little bit on your own, unfortunately. But I have one file called compile. That's in short form what you have actually have to do. I have one called environment. that you can, uh, this is a, 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 an, an interesting little piece, but we'll get to that later. And I prepared a, a readme document, which is, uh, as we looked upon before, and the, the most important things to be, to be read is here as you also mentioned in the theory, but I also included it here in, in the in the notes on variables in, in the examples. Anyway, we need to load some modules. We need to load the Fortran at CDF module. I should have done module purge before, but I, I haven't loaded any modules. So now we can say module list. You see, it, it loads up a whole bunch of modules. Um, PCC, a NUMA control, com, uh, compress XZ, and so on. A lot of interesting things, open MPI. So it does an and HDF5. So it actually do a lot of things for us and dzip, lz, zip4, etc. And netcdf for Fortran. Of course, it has to do netcdf for C also, because the Fortran relies on, on netcdf for C. So what else do we need to do? Now we loaded the Fortran module, but in order to, to um, make the include parts correct because I use Fortran modules and the Fortran modules are in the include files. So we need to to change from the C path, which contains the include files for C, over to the Fortran syntax. And don't fall into the trap and think that F path is the include file path for for Fortran. It's not, it's, uh, it's something to do with the shell, functions in the shell. So don't fall into that trap. The easiest thing to do is to uh, set the include variable to the thing I've done here. We can say echo, no, C path. We get a very long thing. The simp is uh, actually it's, this is enough, but then you need to cut and paste and so on. It's actually easier to say export include equals this little piece here. This um, is actually is actually displaying C path and expanding it and and put it into more Fortran syntax, which is minus I for include. So we can echo the include variable. You now see that all the include statement, they start with minus capital I. And there is a blank delimiter and yet another minus I for the next one. And you can, Chew a little bit on, on this one and see how things are, are done here. So, yeah, how the C path and, and slash and slash and so on, how, how that one works. A little trip, uh, bash trick. Now we have the include variable set and we have loaded the correct modules. We could go into some of the examples. We go to, we switch to example one. 
How simple can you make it? Okay, as always, there's a readme file. Do always read the readme file. I'm also reading release notes, etc. but it's more important to read the readme file. The readme file is normally giving you giving you all the, the hints that you actually need. <clears throat> there are a couple of things to set the include. You could use awk to set only the first one, or you could do as I set all of it. It's it's your choice. But in any case, it's an exercise in how to use um, how to play with the shell. So we now have set the, the, the variable. So we could, in principle, just just um, run the, the lines I have done here with G Fortran, etc. We could do that, or we could read a little bit more about the Fortran environment. This sets the variables kind types to var to values for integer 8, 16, 32, and similar for other data types. So there's also a mention of using the ISO binding. Then they, they will the variables will be given kind numbers related to the, the syntax from C. So as I said, knowledge of C is nice, but you don't really have to know much of, on, on syntax of C, only the the the, the variables. And some 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 other things that you come in handy. So read the readme files and, and when you have time. So rather than type along, we'll um, we'll set some times that you can play with, with some of these also. But I made a make file. You can either do the line in the readme file or you can look on the make file. Since there have been requests for make files and how to make make files, I have tried now to to in, to include make files and written them as simple as possible. So we for those of you who know make very well, bear over with with uh, that I give you with the teaspoon once again. I set some variables. I set FC to G Fortran. I set the option for to as a optimize level two. I set debug to minus G and I set the library to L for library, link, link library, net CDF for run. So the lib, and then I have the first one. This is the, the name of the, of the program to make the executable. It has a, a dependency of, of this file. So if you compile this file, that will give us this one, the executable. For track compiler, options include, you see, option has normal parentheses because they are internal to the make file. If you want to include, if you want to have a symbol that is not in the make file, but it's a, a shell variable, you have to use the curly brackets, which I've done here. Hence that you only need to set this include once. And then minus O for output and you get this one. This is the name of the executable, which is by coincidence the same as here. Then the source file and linking the library. So going back to the readme file, we can say, do it the simple, the hard way, so to say. We can start with the first example here. It, oh, Saga is slow today. So the first example, it build, but we'll need to know what does it do. So I, so, as I said, all NetCDF uh, procedures, procedure is a common name for all kinds of routines. They are functions 
the library is C-based. That's been repeated too many times already. And in Fortran, all functions return a value which must be assigned. Also important. Then we use the ISO environment. We use NetCD environment, uh, NetCDF. They, those are Fortran modules that you cannot pick up. They are they be, they've been looked for in in the um, include variables. That's why we need to set the include. So that's fine. Implicit none, as I said, never leave home without it. So that no undeclared variables will be allowed. We use only integers. I say that the integer of the parameter, uh, integer 32, so a 32-bit integer, it's a parameter, so it's immutable. It has a fixed value at declare time, 10 in this case. Then we declare some variables for, for N, uh, NCID, which is the file ID or the data set ID or whatever the variable ID and the dimension ID. They have to be 32-bit. Then I make, just to make it more fun, or fun or whatever you like to call it, I set 8-bit for the status. Status is generally a small integer. Then we come to our, our actual data. This is a simple example dealing with integers, 32-bit integers, uh, they have a dimension n, so n equals 10 up here, it's fixed value to 10, so we declare a, a vector of size 10, and I also give it a value, assign a value. So this is a mutable variable, so I could change this, uh, this vector later on. I use the, the square brackets to tell that this is a vector. So Fortran has the vector syntax uh, way of doing things. So you can assign and make a vector of, of, of brackets, square brackets, and it will be assigned to the variable A and you have 10 numbers. One of, of the strength of Fortran is the, oh, it's been too big in the, Yeah, so I just have a file. I did not bother to give it a file name. I was lazy. And I'm creating a HDF file version four, which is the same as a, as a NetCDF version four. So I said one dimension integer net and version four is, is implied by this file name I give. I call up the function create. I use the NF90 clubber, which means that the file could be overwritten if it already exists. And the variable N NCID is the file ID. And we're good to go. You can read though for, I included the, what you can do here, most, most common is, is clubber or no clubber. If you use no clubber, you are sure that you don't overwrite all data. Then NCID is the handle, is comparable to, to the unit number in Fortran or the file um, pointer in C. N is the name of the dimension and the dimension DMID is one for one dimension. So we call define the dim ID. We call it N. We give it uh, the number 10, which is defined earlier as an unmutable fixed number. And the dim ID is supposed to be returned to us when we when we um, call this function. We could print it later on, but yeah. Um, here I check the status value. Is this correct or not? If it's not, then call exit one. Actually, it should be exit two anyway. It doesn't matter. Uh, I use small letters here, but normally 
um, fixed values like this are referred to as, as uh, capital letters, but Fortran doesn't care about this, uh, the capital letters. Or, but it's to signify that this is a, a number coming from, it's a fixed uh, number for, as a parameter number if given to us by the NetCDF. So a uh, int is a 32-bit integer and variable is the variable ID handle. So we defined the variable. First up here, we defined the dimension, which is length of 10. We now call the data set is called A. It's integer. Here we actually need to know that NCDF, NetCDF int is 32-bit integer. So we call this int here. The dim ID, which we got from here, so this is the, the dimension and the variable ID here, which is returned to us. Then we finalize the dimension definitions. We say that status and end domain of the data set, the data set handle, which is the NCID. Then we output the data, we write the data to the file or the, the, the data set uh, defined by the NetCDF um, NCID, or, or and which is in our case is the file, and the variable ID, and the data contained in that A. And A was assigned up here, one, zero to nine. So we write that out, we close the file, And I'm not sure if we, yeah, we close the file and we should be good to go. But I have used up here, I used the, the subroutine check to show you that there are many ways to skin a cat. Um, here, I know that a lot of people prefer this syntax, so I included it here so you can pick the one you like. Here I insert, I encapsulated the NetCDF call with a check function or check subroutine that you can call. So it looks nicer for some people, depends on how you like it. And that check subroutine is included below here. It contains in the program check status. Status is the output from the NetCDF function. It's a 32-bit integer. I check if it's no error. If it's an error, I print out return with error. And I also print out the, the error string of the status called exit2 and the program exits. So there is no common answer to, to which syntax you should use and how you should deal with it. This is up, totally up to you. you I, I normally maybe we do like this, but the, the, the check is also, so yeah. Uh, if you're lazy, do like me. I mean, if it if it crashes, it crashes. Um, then you might put in something to, to check the crashes. So you see, most of my programs just say the set the status to some, I don't bother to check the status. If it's all worked, it's okay. If it doesn't, then you crashes. Since normally there is something terribly wrong, but if you are concerned that the program should continue even with an error here, you should test the error and deal with it accordingly. So, can we compile this one again? We now have seen, take a look on, on the syntax of the program and the program itself. It compiled. And um, for those who have followed me before, I normally are too lazy to, to bother to give it a name, but this time I actually give it the name. And the program is called one, the one dimension integer. We run it, nothing happened. We can even say echo dollar to see the return value because a dollar question mark gives you the return value of the program. It returned without any errors. So we should have a file 
yes, we have two files. The other one is old. We have a file from today called bond int nc4. Let's say what happened if we say, try to do a file on it. Ah, the program, <laughs> yeah, the program. The program, of course, is a 64-bit executable. But if we do a file on this one, you see there are some magic numbers in the file that tell, tell us that the, the file nc4 is a netcdf data format file. Now we could say nc dump. Like this, it actually works. So maybe you want to try this yourself. I can leave a few minutes for all of you to, to try it. Um, we can go over to the collaborative document and see if you Yeah. Yeah. You could put in some. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can put uh, that is you are expecting them to do this uh, compiling and sim uh, running the yeah. program under example one, right? Yeah, under example one. There yeah. are, of course, we can say make one D. There are. There are four examples. So you could say. Instead of just compiling as I did, you could say 1D int is up to date. There's only one thing I want to make sure and tell you about the make file. Here, clean up. If I want to clean everything, I can say clean. But there is a little trick here. If you by coincidence have a file called clean, that could happen. Then it will try to make that one. So I put in the phony argument and say that the clean is a phony one, which is mean that it's not, don't look for the file called clean. Look on the symbol here. So if I say make clean, it will remove all of it. Of course, it complains about those who are not there. But I can say make 1D int. Huh? What happened? It worked a few minutes ago. Demo effect. Hmm. Error in the make file. So far, so good. Okay, I see that there are some errors getting with the yeah, main file. some errors in the main. It doesn't really matter because you can just have to clean that up. I'm not really sure what happened. But we can do, you can easily do it by the hard way. Here. It's a bit strange that there are, I just 
tested it before starting today. Like or what else did we have? We have real. And double. I mean, using the, the the real and double are a mixture of different syntaxes, but I think it's important to know that double generally means 64 bit and real generally means 32 bit integers, no, uh, floats or floating point numbers. And that C and Fortran have different syntax, and both of these syntaxes should be known. I think we should set aside a few more minutes to 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 deal with the with the examples. Uh, yes, I can yeah, do have, that. I I put up a ample time for everything today, so we should we should be good on time, so we can give 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 more time to 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 test the examples and to review the examples. Yeah, how many minutes do you want me to? Uh, five minutes and I'll run through the five or 10 minutes and I run through the examples because I, I deliberately changed the syntax slightly in each one of them. Okay. Yeah, we will give uh, 10 minutes to yeah. do this exercise and then yeah. uh, maybe uh, 12 minutes. Uh, we will come back at uh, 10.40 um, and I would highly appreciate if you put uh, all your uh, if there is an error message or anything on this collaborative document. Um, yeah, I'll be here watching everything. So just uh, use the collaborative document. So, yeah. And also you can uh, voice it out. I will uh, edit it uh, before publishing the recording. So that's not a problem. See from the from the chat in, in, in Zoom that there are some issues with the cannot open the NetCDF mod, which is the Fortran module, which is pointed to by, by the include. But there are different way of doing include. I mean, some of them uh, doesn't work well. Some, as we saw, if you set it either using the aux syntax in the readme file to take only the first one, which is actually enough, or just put it into put it into the uh, the a a a manually. But of course, this one here includes that you see, but take only the first one, dollar one is the first argument. If you, if you do this and then the, it will only contain the first one and the make file will run. So that's the simplest way. Just do use the 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 aux syntax and and set it. I thought I had this figured out, but uh, apparently not. But the first one is enough because that's the. But that might not be true if we load some different modules. That's why I wanted to take them all to scan through all of them. And of course, using the make file is one thing, but it's actually the make file is actually doing this. So you can actually easily see what the make file is doing and, and copy paste that one and adapt. But since they've been uh, always a um, request for make files, I, I made one. But uh, I mean, yeah, we all know the benefit of the make files. So nobody has said I need more time or I'm stuck or I'm le I'm not trying to now. So yeah, 
then we it can is continue it... with the with the the next example yeah and then we can take a break yeah the this one is um, is, is using long int so it's more or less exactly the same but i've changed a few things first of all i changed to say that this is integer 64. Uh, integer 64 comes from the fortran standard iso environment which gives us some macro vari variables and the variable here contains a kind number giving us an integer 64 under this environment so this is the proper way of doing it. That always will work. Um, I changed here. Uh, first of all, I said 1D long int and netcdf version 4. So we'll create a version 4 file. And of course, this is the, the data set handle or the file handle, since I only have one data set. Uh, so netcdf4, which is here. And this is identical to HDF5. So the ha we use the and CID handle just like before, and a little bit support more tapes than the classic. This one you can read when you have time. And of course, Fortran doesn't support unsigned integers, which is important. So. It's only int that are of interest to us and string. So we need to change this one to an integer 64 since we declared the variable up, up here as 64. The array A or the vector A, it contains 10 64 bit numbers or long in uh, 64 bit long integers. Same as before, we end, we put the data out, we close. And there are no call function defined because I only use status at all of them. And you can see I'm only tested once because there might be a chance that something is wrong with this file or whatever. So I was not too lazy. I put in some test here. For the others, I didn't bother to put in the tests. This is up totally up to you if you want to test everything or if you just assume that it's okay. But it would be bad if by the end of a four week simulation, spending a couple of million of our core hours, it crashes because you omitted a test and something. So it's up to you. So, We can use the, the make file one D long. We run the one D long. Right. And we have already done file on, on the You see the different versions now, because if we remember from int, that was netcdf, but this one gave us hierarchical data format, so hdf5 type compatible format, so differently. So file to test the content, so the magic numbers or, or the, the metadata on files are important. So. Uh, can you repeat what you said, Ole, about the HDF5? Mm -hmm. The data type here, if we check what kind of file the NCF, NCDF4 is, yeah. you see that this is now a hierarchical data format, yeah, yeah, which exactly. is identical to, net, to HDF5 file, which yeah. is still an NCDF file, but it's a different, and it contains compatibility with, with NetCDF5. Or, yeah. or or HDF five, yeah. And that's, those two uh, are more or less identical. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so there is no conversion needed for an HDF four to HDF five if you want to no. use it. Yeah, as here it says here, and this is just yeah. cut and paste from some manual. Net CDF four and HDF five are identical. 
Yeah, yeah, I uh, that was one of the reasons I would like to use an HDF for now onwards. Yeah, and you can okay. check whether or not the file is that on that format by using file. But we can also say nc dump one d long let's see the f4 and this doesn't give us that kind of information it just gives information of dimensions n equal 10 it gives us the, the information about the variables and it's in 64 and it gives the data printed as integer because it is integers so that's okay now we take a, a major step out to numbers where there is an infinite number of numbers of course there are an infinite numbers of of integers but there are even more more real numbers than integers because between one and zero or zero and one there are an infinite number of real numbers but of course not on the computers because they have they have um, a limited set of numbers as you can see here there's only 32 bits set aside for a floating point number and it's still the dimension of 10 but instead of just coming up with numbers, I use the Fortran vector function called call random number and you give it an argument A. That means that every element in A is given a random number. They're all different. And I now could use the HDF5 syntax. So this is actually be netcdf4, but the compatible with HDF5. So it's a HDF5 now file. The rest are the same. We create the file. We um, the dimension is called n, and here we get the return. We return the the dim id, which nobody care what, what the actual numerical value is but it's a variable containing the dimension id of course if you have many dimension you need to, to have an array or whatever or you give them different names etc that's totally up to the programmer and we now define that that it is a 32-bit real so we need to use the c syntax once again c comes back we used to say real uh, which is 32 bit and this is using the dimension id and now we get the return value variable id we end the definitions we write print out no we write out the values to the file and we close the whole thing and that should give us We can run make again. Real. Now we got the one D real. Okay. We write that and then we check the output file one d real nc it should actually be an nc4 but uh, i did uh, maybe i did it on purpose or i just forgot but anyway file will give us the actual type of of file it's a hierarchical data format so hdf5 format it will be very nice, it easily read since they are identical to NetCDF4. It's okay. And then we say NC dump one dimension real NC. Now we see that we have the same, we have dimension equals 10. Variables are of type float, and the data set is called A. 
and it has 10 values and those 10 values are printed for us as we see. So, so far, it seems to be okay. But we can open now the one dimension double. We have a break after, after this one. Now I said real 64. I said 1D double, I used the clubber, I made it more compact because I took away all the all the comments. That's already been the so how simple can it be? This is all you need. You actually don't need the line here either. You can get away with this status line. Dimension ID, variable ID, and put means putting it into the file, closing. It's fairly simple. If you get the hang of it and start using it, you, your programs will look quite quite simple like this. And we say make one D double. And the make file prepare it for us. We run it. Now it's net CDF because we, I asked for, I didn't say anything about the file, I just said net CDF clobber. That could be overwritten. We can test that, we can run it again. It's going to be overwritten. Ten fifty one. If I write it again, fifty two. So it's clearly overwritten. But we can dump the file, see what's inside. Ah, yeah, of course, the program wouldn't be dumped. <laughs> So we see that, but you also see that there are much more decimals in, in, in the numbers, which mean that they are double precision. Double precision is, is an awkward name, that's an old Fortran name, but <coughs> it's called single precision and double precision, but the, the numbers stick. So generally 32-bit is single precision, 64-bit is double precision, FP floating point 16 is half precision, floating point eight, doesn't have a common name yet because it's so strange that you have a an eight bit floating point number, but that's a lot used in machine learning. So now we're done with the the first examples. The first examples are very easy. They are just a single vector with some some numbers, and maybe it's time either for break or for to continue on next example but maybe we could opinion. take a, a break early uh, yeah what do you think a break would be would be quite nice to, yeah we have one more hour or more so so it's okay that we have to go yeah. to the example number two so there are five it, examples Yes, we can go through this after the break. But you can uh, write to or write on the collaborative document. Is there is something you are wondering, or we you want to have a bit uh, more explanation on some of the programs? Please go ahead and write. Use the collaborative document. Thank you. We will come back at ten past eleven. Uh, so welcome back again. Yeah, I think almost thirty seconds. Or you may yeah. know the exact time, but uh, are you going to give more time to uh, now uh, go through the examples or just to demo it? Because we have. I, yeah, I will, we'll run through all the demos and then we can have some time at the end for questions and so on. But yeah, yeah, 
that would be great yeah. because we yeah. may not have time to schedule for exercise even after. though I, I i tried to to set aside a lot of time but this example takes some time but it's it's very good it is uh, uh your own code like that you don't uh create any from any example file from uni data so yeah no i'll is... yeah and then all the examples i have written or most of them myself they yeah they all say if you look on on top here they can see that i've written them myself so any errors or any any stupid things that are here are mine um now we 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 turn up the we step up the ladder in, in in complexity a little bit now we actually are moving on towards some more sensitive sensible data not sensitive they are to more more complex data um this time we start with writing out some data but we start with with more than um, than uh, we've done before we have we still have 10 and we have uh, integer uh, we have real numbers and but we have some some more we have field where id and and a little bit more so the right example is not that hard we use the clubber we overwrite if possible nc1 now i'm starting to become lazy as you see i just mentioned them nc1 etc random numbers into the field um yeah it's not that much special before i give them the data it's dim size and rank and variable id um the names are a bit bit longer and so this is more starting to become more real life um what's going on here make clean make nc right now we got a program called nc right the data set is written we use file on nc1 if i recall correctly let's see the f then we as an NC dump, nothing really fancy here. So we just jump straight to the next program, NC read. So now we are going to read a data set, but we need to know, we need to know what's in there. So we know need to know that it's 10. And we also open it no write because we are not going to write, we are only going to read. So we open it no write, read only. And since we know the names and so on, because somebody have informed us or we have dug them out from the NC dump, etc. We can just put in the numbers, the, the the data that we already have. So there are no unknowns here, which is the important stuff. We need to know everything that is to know about the data before we can actually read it in, like the data called field, etc., and the type and so on. And of course we need to know the length because we have to have set aside enough space here. Here you see we use get, which is reading data in, and the A is the variable, which is declared up here, fixed with the dimension N, which we already know, it's 10. So we can We can do read data set red, which was the same as we had when we wrote it, wrote it to the file. We can say dumb, same thing, 3216. Yep. 
So, so far, fairly easy. Now we'll assume that we don't know what's inside there. We need to look most of it up. There are a few things that we have to assume. First of all, we don't know the name of the, we don't know the length of the name. We don't know the length of the dimension. So hence I set unknown or, or does the column could be anything. And I have to make it allocatable because we don't know how long it is. So already here it's starting to be a bit harder. We have opened the, the input file, hence I put in some more printout here to telling us that things going on. I use a different syntax for the test. I put the if test here and call exit. So yeah, if we come here, we know that the file is open correctly. Then we run a new function called inquire, which try to learn as much as possible from or from the input file. So we have the dimension. So there are no loops. You only know that there is one dimension, only one variable, left, so to say. And we print out the name. It trim away blanks and so on. And we we try to get we get hold of the data type. But this is tricky since we get the data type, but we need to declare something up here. So we actually need to know the data type before. Otherwise we would have to set aside variables of all sorts and sizes to be used. It's easy to do that, but it requires more programming. So we print out a lot of things. We inquire the dimension. Well, first of all, we inquire the variable here. We inquire the dimension. We inquire the variable ID. We, when we got all of this, we allocate the variable of the length. Length we have up here because we have we have asked for the length of, of the dimension here. So we allocate here. And then we read it in and we print it out. And down here is a, is a function I wrote to print out what kind of data type it is. But it's already up here. We already know beforehand that it's actually a a real 32 a, a, a float so if you want to know if you want to have everything unknown it's require much more programming so there is a trade-off but i think it could be important to 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 know a file to know that you can read slightly unknown files. So, nc read unknown. It opened the input file, so that went fine. n dimension is one, n variables one, attribute number, there are no attribute. Uh, unlimited dimensions, uh, none. Variable ID is one. Uh, the data set name is field. The data type is five, which compared to float. And dimension one and one and the dimension one, dimension ID has the name of data. The length is 10. The variable is called data. I read it in and we arrive at these numbers. Check and see dump and see. And see one. So they are did I 
and z1, these numbers should be comparable. Yep, now they are. I just run the program twice, so now they are okay. Now you see the numbers are the same as, as written out. So this is a slight introduction to how to deal with, with unknown data set. It's not trivial. So most of the time you will know what's going on, but we can go to example three, which is a little bit more. Uh, Ude, yep. can you uh, uh, can you stretch your terminal a little bit on the left side or towards the so, markdown? Yeah. Yeah. It's almost. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you. Now we have. I have still have the NC. We will go to take this simple. These are uh, these are part of these are not written by me. This is a, a piece of from the from the, the the one that are comes with the net CDF. And you, you can easily you need see, data. Yeah, you need data. They are using the triple do loops and so on, which is not really my um, my cup of tea. So. I rewritten them a little bit, so we'll we'll um, we'll go on with with the ones I have written. So they are called right x y. Now we are doing it even a bit more complicated. We are setting some parameter x and y two-dimensional, they are allocatable in integer and real, allocatable, and call random numbers for the random field. And I use a trick. I am, um, since I couldn't make random numbers in integers, they are float. So I allocated the data called R, for random, then I took the floor value by 100 times R and deallocate R and put that into data. So I now have a have a matrix of of um, integer data, and it also comes with a nice way of doing allocation. I allocate here and I play and I run use the way use the matrix R, and then I deallocate R. So I reclaim the memory. And I get command line argument. So I ask for the file name to be written. Do some status of, of dimensions. You see now there are two dimensions. And, and the dim ID is X and Y. I fill up the vector and fill the matrix write the data structure to the file, which is called data, which is the number, which is the, the one here in X and Y, six and 12. And of course, these data now are randomly between zero and 99. Print it out and close. So write X and Y, make, I recall we need to supply a 
a number here. And of course, you see there is no test. So if I forget to supply the file name, it will not go very well. So we can call this nc2.nc. Does not exist before. Right. Cool. This is how we write out two dimensions. And we have to read in two dimensions. Not so different from the others. We need to know that there are 6 and 12. We need to know that they are integers. We um, need to check the file name. So here I put in the test for the file name. So if you get if the not file name doesn't exist or something else is wrong, you get an error. We allocate space. We inquire the data, and we get some information, and we read it in and close, and we're done. So it's actually not very hard if you get some hang of it. Hopefully, there should be similar. Let's see the variable not found. Uh -huh. This was strange. I have run these examples so many times. What did we make wrong here? This was quite interesting. Would it be? Huh. Huh. How could this one slip through? Huh. That was a bummer. Huh. I thought I had made this example so many times. So there was a data here and not matrix. Now it's so important. The names must also match. Anyway, we could try to make to read this as an unknown because we have the, the unknown program. No, I did not make the make file to 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 accommodate that. That's an exercise for you to try to compile the um, read unknown to read the file this time. But the file nc2 is net CDF data. And we already run the dump of it. which is the same as we got when we read. But here, we will, if we didn't know that it was matrix, we look up here and the dump file, and you see that there's a matrix, that it's called matrix. And I had made a mistake, called it data, and it didn't match, and it doesn't work. So this are, and you see, I got two errors here when I had data. So maybe I did, did put that one in on purpose. 
it's a little a few weeks since I last uh, wrote this this so that probably a uh, stumbling stone I put in deliberately anyway we have to run through some more examples example four they are they are all along the same line so they are not too different so here are a file to check these are you see now we are coming into some some real data here so as always what's inside the real yeah inquire the netcdf file make nc check and what does nc check do It has a function number to type. So as before, it, it will in inquire the data type. It will uh, declare some of these variables that, but they are now, they are now um, dimensions or, or arrays or, or vectors because we don't know how long things are in this file. So I don't have to put in use maximum number of dimensions, set aside space to that. Some number, even more variables to print out and some group exist. You can also have groupings in here, make it even harder. Max file name. We have the interface for this function. This is just to telling the program how to call the function up here. The main program start here. We inquire the file, we read the file from here. I actually put in a test. If you don't give any argument, you get slapped on the lap with your fingers. And we check for the input file. We open the input file. We inquire. We find groupings. If there are no groups, we find variables. These are just print out of what you find into the file. This is not really something that need to be gone through in detail because this is something you actually need to sit down and play with yourself if you are ever going to need to, to read unknown files. So they are in there to see that it's self-describing format most of the things you can have in, in, in a NetCDF file can be extracted. So we try to make it. It's up to date, so it's OK, but we don't trust that one. We compile it. So this is something that you will play with if you actually need to write a file yourself that that uh, that you want to check what's what's in the file, what's going on. Ah, okay. We have the air monitor mean NC. There are three dimensions or 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 or, or different variables. There are four variables number of variables that could be there are eight attribute number and there are three unlimited dimensions so there are no groups there are four variables so with variable ids one two three four there are three dimensions with the dimensions one two three four and there are no parents and again three dimensions with endims there are one variable. The first variable is num type number five. Here, this number five need to be to be translated into numbers that we know. Float. The number variable number two is float. The number three is double. Float. And the dimension IDs is latitude, longitude, and time. There are seventy three of this one of latitude. 144 of longitude 
and 871 of the time dimension. So the variable attributes are printed here. So this is a program I wrote to inquire about the file. You can copy it or you can find some of the others, but this is how to to get some extract some data on the about the file, which you can program in if that's the type of file you actually want to know. So you can put these numbers in into your read program to read that kind of file. And if you say NC dump on this one, I think we'll put in some limited. You see, this is a bit more than we are normally used to see. You see, time is set to unlimited. And of course, there are a lot more sensible information than we actually normally will see. And these are just the numbers in there. We can run that one on, on the ESMWF data set. You see, we get that much, much, much more. They are on different type. They are, you see, there are a lot of them. There are 20 variables, IDs, variables, and so on. Float, float, integer, short, short, short. Many of them are short, etc. So these are the things that contains in this file that if you want to read, you have to program in these numbers or write a program that actually can do it yourself. So it's non-trivial. So this is something you can play with. So any questions about that before we go to the last example directory? I'll... I don't see any questions and just want to have a comment that I usually use the NC dump to just to know the uh, variables and things. Yes, NC yeah. dump is an excellent little, little program, but I wanted to show that you yeah. can write that yourself and inquire everything yeah. there is to know about the file in, from within Fortran. So you can, if you want to read this file, you can inquire and of course to read it requires knowledge of type and a lot of things. So you see there now the AC and WF are using short, of course, to save space since it's only two byte. Um, yeah. So yeah, NC dump, I, I repeatedly use NC dump here, but it's also a little exercise in programming. But That's since there are no, no. very good uh, exercise for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the next example is the last example. Um, these are actually more, more um, sensible example. Um, Pressure, temperature, read. It should be. Of course, it should be right first. Pressure and temperature for the right F90. So we go to example five. Now I'm on the one that you can't see, but I'll it over the programs here are supposed to be slightly more slightly more um, relevant so they are becoming increasingly complex so but as always We'll need some hints. I there are is a, something called field data structure, single time step. So since I made that one, it must apparently be something something important. And there are some tricky ways to fill the data structure. 
that you can play around here. You can look upon yourself about how you do reshaping, etc. So it's uh, an interesting little exercise with implied do loops, etc. So read that one. And we can see what the NC dump for the NC, what it says. It says that our 18 levels, 72 latitude, 144 longitude, and time is unlimited. So I just want to see the one I made for, yeah, this is a, a simpler one. Yeah, this is a simpler one. Yep. So now we have pressure temperature in 4D. I changed it a little bit. These are now from the, let's take a look at this one. Yeah, the 4D is, is my rewrite of the example. Yep, sorry for that. The, the, the one, the one that uh, I first brought up was the was the and unit data's example pressure temperature 4D write and read. So I made one that write is in four dimension using my program, and then I use NetCDF and 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 some other tricky things to 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 display it. But this one we will go through and. The other one is, is, is uh, comparable to mine, but uh, I use a slightly more syntax. Since I said the modern vector syntax is used as much as possible. Uh, two fields, pressure and temperature of longitude, latitude, and, um, and level. These are field, filled with randomly fluctuating data and written out to a NetCDF file. And I don't, yeah. So, how to compile? I use ISO Fortran, NetCDF. The, I don't know how long the file name can be, so I use the, the constant max file name and integer to have the file ID, the file handle. I generate four dimensional data. The, Parameter are fixed set at compile time using the attribute parameter, immutable parameter are written in capital letters. Fortran is case sensitive, but it makes it easier to spot immutable values. So as these numbers here are also immutable, these numbers here are also in capital, which indicates that they are immutable fixed numbers. So four dimensions, level, longitude, latitude, and time. There are N records, 500 time records, 500 records in total, but they are five in, in the time dimension, 18 levels of height, 72 of latitude and, and longitude, and some, some character values. I use a strisk here to indicate that there is an unknown. That doesn't work if the if it's not the parameter. If it's a parameter, of course, the Length is known here at compile time, so you don't need to specify it. If it's not a parameter, you need to put a number in here. But if it's parameter, it's fixed, so immutable. Then I declare some ID variables. They have to be 32 bit. Longitude and latitude. Dimension, you see, the, the dimension is unknown. And the long variable ID and the latitude variable ID. But I declare the dimension unknown. But I declare them here with n lats and n long. And those numbers are fixed. So even though the dimension is set to unknown here, the dimension is fixed here. 
I have two variables for the temperature and pressure field. I have the name, pressure name, temperature name, and they are pressure variable ID and temperature variable ID. They are the total to choose ID. And there are normally an array for dimension ID. So I have a dimension here of, of the dimensions. Then I assign attributes to the variables, units, uh, hectopascal, Celsius, degree east, degrees north and east. Then I have the field variable. There are, they are four dimensional pressure and pressure temperature uh, and pressure temporarily and pressure and pressure temporarily. That will become later why I need some temporal variables. I start with a sample pressure of, of 10, 1013.0, which is the normal pressure, 15 degrees centigrade. I declare latitude and longitude minus 90, minus 177.5. A resolution is 2.5. Some loop indices and the status variable. The main body start here. I allocate the data. If it's not working, exit. I allocate the temporal, the temperature and, and pressure. I fill the latitude and longitudes since they are adding the constant, they are 2.5 in the resolution variable to fill up the whole globe. I said set pre all, all the pressure grid points to the sample pressure. I set all the temperature to the sample pressure so they're all set to 10, 13, and 15. Then I run through all the records to input num random numbers. And you see those random numbers are input to the temporal ones. Then I update each individual record, not the first one, but everybody up until the last one. And since this run loops to n record minus one, which is 100, 499 and 499 plus one is 500. So that makes up. Then I transform to plus minus five degrees and I, I multiply by three to scale up the deviation. I deallocate the temporary ones. I do some simple checking, which I commented out. We read the file name, outfile.nc. We give define the dimension, and you see the dim IDs here. They are, have names, not array. And define variable for coordinates. Like here, they are real. Let long are real. And I put in attributes, the units for lat and long. They have variable IDs with sensible names. And we use the dim ID to pass the dimension to the net CDF variable. So I put all these dim IDs into a, an array. And this is the vector syntax with the bracket, uh, with the square bracket parentheses. And I define the variable for pressure and temperature. It's a bit complicated program. You have to, to, to sit down and, and re review this yourself because this is a more realistic example. It took it took a little bit of time to write it out and get everything wrong. And define, here I actually put down the variables. Now I have lats and longs and the data. That's the coordinate, coordinate, um, coordinated, coordinates, coordinating. It should be coordinates, not coordinating. Misspelling mistake. Um, I put in the pressure and temperature. 
These are the two names of the variables, and these are the pressure fields. Close, deallocate, and written. So, will it work? That's the question. Did I make a make file for this? Yeah. It's actually compiled. Wow. And I'm the way I see it can be overwrite the old one. That's important. Here it says clobber, so I can overwrite it. So if I now say write for d for d dot nc it will write out the data field. It takes some time. It's a lot of data at five hundred time steps. Yes, 500 times they've written to the 4D file called 4D.nc, file 4D, it's a netcdf one, nc dump 4D. 18 levels, 72 latitude, 744 longitude, unlimited, currently 500. It print out how many you have currently. Some variables, degrees east, degrees north, latitude and flow pressure, time, level, latitude, longitude. This is the, the four-dimensional field, which has units, pressure units. So here comes the sensible thing with, with the attributes, how important that can be. Of course, you can have a very long string here. You can write a, sh a short story here or an essay here explaining more. And they are Celsius. Then comes the latitude data. And the pressure data, the first one is only 1013. And of course, it will continue with a lot of data further on. So we should visualize by NC view. That's another, another um, module we have to load. Module load, is it NC view, or is it something other? I have forgotten that one. Almost, I just forgot the... Yeah, there are some this. two modules, uh, Yeah. 2021 and 2022A. It complains, but okay. To make sure that now we can say uh, no variable selected. pressure and there is also you can see the the map yes okay you can run it then it will yeah i was just now it's Yeah, now it's running. Now you can see that it actually something is happening. Uh, maybe the, the random function is applied to the whole global field of temperature. Or is it just me? I cannot see the changes. 
there are some slight changes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. They will. They will become. I think it's a bit slow running in this X11 program over, over um, the network, and even yeah. But you see, there are some some gradually. You see some granulation. It it will be more. There are some random fluctuation in in the in the pressure field, which I deliberately put in. So this is a way of visualizing it. It's a bit slow. It's frame. It behaves so slowly, it's hard to know which one of the of the arrows that work. But you see that there is some it, it gradually increase yeah. the random fluctuations of, of, of the pressure of, of the globe. So this is a way of visualizing the data we just provided. And of course, the, the latter examples are more complex, and it will take it would require a couple of days to 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 handle those with the, as we thoroughly we did with the the first one. But the first one, I think it's important to that that you get the hang of of the ideas behind it and becoming gradually more complex. So. We'll see how this evolves. It, 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 it gradually provides more and more granularity of, of, the, of the pressure field. The same goes with the temperature. It will uh, provide more or less the same. So how did how I do this one? Here are the random numbers applied. And of course, you see the beauty of the Fortran, Fortran um, vector syntax. I update the whole complex data structure, the whole data structure here by calling random here. And then I can say all field except this one here, which is called record plus one, are supposed to be updated. And this one is rec. And this is rec plus one, so I take the former and I just add them up and up and up. And of course, there is a lot of of of, of stories with um, with writing out the data, but not as much as you would expect. Even the attributes and so on. So it's it's within reason to 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 read this and understand what's going on, even if it's writing out a a real data type field with, with the in four dimensions. So with that, we'll see if there's questions. This is the chance to ask questions. Yeah, um, this uh, is a comment that we are asking feedback for the day. This is the first time we are running such courses specifically focused on some uh, data format. Since we have uh, many users who deals with uh, NetCDF uh, file format. And this course provides you to an introduction, how to read and write, and you can go through this uh, demo programs and um, try your uh, hands on it. Uh, 
if they need a data that they uh, I was mentioning a lot of time, also me, myself, I have a good documentation of NetCDF with this uh, course. And then you go through this um, uh, documentation, you, you get enough uh, uh, knowledge about the NetCDF uh, files. Most of the people who works in geoscience and especially the climate people, uh, they have to use uh, this NetCDF format either on Fortran or other kind of uh, Python or something else. Uh, just some, uh, if you are running and creating some NetCDF files, some best practices recommendation is use attributed names from published conventions. Some of the um, uh, the CMIP 6 or 7 IPCC models, they have specific conventions. So uh, long name for a human readable descriptive name. Um, if you use it, you can, when you plot, you can use it as a label as well. And there are some convention, uh, some of the uh, model group. Uh, specify that you, you should use this specific attributes. So it would be good uh, that when you're creating that kind of uh, NetCDF files after your simulation, and uh, use the best practices. Uh, Unidata, had, uh, I remember almost a decade ago, they have a best practices uh, course for NetCDF format. Uh, I could find some materials from Unidata and put it here, but this this course Ule was giving, give you a specific basic information about how to read and write and where to look, uh, uh, check your NetCDF data. And I think you are good to go with this specific course, but really would like to have this um, feedback so that we could improve. And we plan to run similar courses in the upcoming um, uh, semester as well as the years to come. So please give us your feedback and thank you for your uh, presence here. And I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot. I, I have learned a lot, especially with NC Chekule. I was never using that kind of program since we was using NC then. Thank you so much for your efforts and hard work, Ule. This is, uh, uh, to me, this is a great uh, course, and I, I hope the same with the other participants. Uh, do you want to talk about a little uh, teaser about tomorrow? Because we are going to cover a different topic tomorrow. Yeah, an introduction for tomorrow. Tomorrow is profiling. Where is your program spending its time? How does it behave? What kind of operations do it do? Where is uh, is your is it limited by memory, or is it limited by computation? Does it do utilize utilize vectors, etc., or whatever else there is to know about performance of your program? So we'll cover two tools. It's the it's the ARM prof, uh, performance reporter and ARM Forge Map. Map will actually go back and, and print out exactly the line in your code where it uses so and so much time. So it can it will go into your actual source code and provide you with with um, with profiling down to the last uh, instruction or or code line. So that will be an interesting story to to have. We are using the the NASA benchmark BT as an example. And there are due to some 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 problems with the with access to to the license server, there are a couple of, of things you need to put into your batch file. And there are two nodes reserved tomorrow. So it could be an interesting exercise tomorrow to to learn how to profile your program. Uh, we have more people sign up for tomorrow that is more general. Uh, not the topic like this. We have this uh, specific on net CDF format. Maybe that is limited to some of the users. But if you are using HPC and you are wondering about the performance for your application, uh, tomorrow is the day that you should attend and look into the methods and the tools we will, we will be showing to you. Uh, 
yeah then one thing about the net cdf format that the time dimension you will you are saying unlimited most of the use cases of that is when you simulate weather forecast or hint cost i would say like as from satellite or observation you usually put that uh, time uh, dimension unlimited so that the next day you can append the observation values uh, of the the previous or the next day so if i have that uh, air um, the monthly air temperature value it might be for like the last day so tomorrow I can update it for the next day. So that's mostly the climate uh, weather forecast and weather forecasters or um, atmospheric meteorologic people use that up and method a lot. That's why most of this uh, ECMWF data, you will have the time dimension unlimited. Right. Anything else you want to mention, Ole? Oh, I think it's okay. Yeah. So there are some uh, performance-based things uh, that is a bit advanced about NetCDF using the PNetCDF library with parallel NetCDF and some bench benchmark things. I could paste some of the links about it, but that that is after you finish it. Uh, so when we publish, uh, archive this Q&A document, you will have the links to those as well. Uh, I yeah. really appreciate uh, your feedback, and Ule, I hope Ule also would like to have the feedback. This is an encouragement for us to run similar courses uh, in the upcoming time as well. So please provide yours. I think we can officially wrap up here and be here for some time for if they, someone wants to voice out their questions. What do you think, Ule? Yeah, we can. Yes, I can stop sharing, and or you can. Stop yeah, recording I will stop and recording, and we will be here. Yeah. yeah. Okay.